How's it growing, everybody? It's Friday. It's always a melty Friday. I always call it Full Melt Fridays. And today I want to talk about one of my favorite parts of the cannabis plant. And uh, we always know that that favorite part that I like so much is, is the, well, what everybody likes is that trichome, that, that little medicinal head that helps us so much and that we love so much. And, you know, I didn't really realize how much that was such a medicinal effect to me. And, and you know what? I want to talk more about it and who better to talk about the triclone other than bubble man marcus gary richardson and uh, i'm pleased to have him on the show today um aka um welcome buddy how are you doing i love the trike behind you yeah threw a little trikes back there while you were talking I, i'm doing good man yeah yeah well you know i I know you really well because you're like you're one of my best friends. I, I've I've spent a lot of time with you, but I mean, uh, most people. Um, in, in your own words, and a few quick words here, how would you describe yourself today? How would I describe myself today? Yeah, definitely a little bit wiser, a little bit more patient. Yeah. Um, you know, still very focused, still very driven, still very passionate. You know, kind of much the, the, the core of who I was 20 years ago is still there today, but I've built around it from all the valuable lessons that I've learned over the course of the last 20 plus years. And yeah, that's, that's kind of who I would say I am today. A little, a little bit the same, a little bit different. Well, you know what? Uh, then I think we should go back 25, 23 years ago and, 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 and go back to the beginning then. I mean, if we're going here now, I think we got to go back. I think we got to go back and, and, and really, I mean, what got you into cannabis from the beginning? Like what, 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 what was that? What got you into cannabis? Was it? I mean, I guess it seemed like a natural choice for me to sort of find myself down that path as I had no interest in alcohol. I had no interest in, in smoking cigarettes. I didn't have an interest in drinking coffee in the morning. All these like early first buzzes that people tune into, I was tuned right out of. And so it sort of made sense that I would naturally get sort of fall into that sort of cannabis dash natural plant medicines category that I didn't really realize at the time existed. But, you know, at 14 years old, I was playing uh, you know, tier hockey in Manitoba, tryout hockey, very serious, definitely no drug use of any sort going on. We were quite young, you know, 13, 14 years old. And uh, the one other guy on my team um, was like, hey, like, I got a, I got a joint. And I was kind of like, oh, a joint, like, like, mar like marijuana. And so he was like, yeah, you want to smoke it with me? And no one else on the team wanted anything to do with it. But I was like, I'll smoke it with you. And uh, I always say that it was very reminiscent of the movie Half-Baked, when Dave Chappelle and all his character friends in the movie are younger and they go and they all puff and then they go into the store and that's when he's hugging the big Abba Zabba bar. He says, Abba Zabba, you my only friend. And that was kind of like metaphorically my experience. I just had this like real like connection and I was like, yeah, this, this is the thing for me. I knew instantly. It's and then it was just a, you know, a very quick sort of like, Oh, like I smoked a joint, like I should buy a gram, I should get a quarter, I should get an ounce, I should get a quarter pound, I should get a half pound, I wonder how much 10 pounds is. Like it just like got ridiculous really fast. I like that. He goes, how much was 10 pounds then? I mean, <laughs> now we'll go back. I mean, you came from like a family, mom worked in law enforcement, dad was very well respected in the community. And uh, I mean, it wasn't like you were from like a, a trailer park family. I like you, you, you grew up in a very, very nice family and stuff. And, and I mean, um, we, you just talked about that first joint. Do you remember what strain it was? I, you know, I really don't. And I don't even know if he would have known or we would have known. I remember specifically just calling it a joint. Like, he, he'd be like, I, ha I got a joint. He probably, like, stole it from his mom or something, you know? like. I like that. So, I mean, now, I'm going to talk about growing, but, I mean, uh, I, I kind of wanted to touch a little bit of bases on 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 Manitoba hemp harvest and 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 how that all accumulated and because you were probably the first person to approach Health Canada in Canada about growing cannabis or hemp like a growing period like I kind of wanted to just touch on that because like we're all about growing our own now and shit I think back then I don't even think people even grow what 
Yeah, no, it was, uh, we weren't the first. I will be honest, we weren't the first. I can shout out the people that were the first, easily Please. enough. Um, that would have been Jeff Keim, yeah. uh, a lawyer. And, oh my goodness, what was the other gentleman's name now? Jeff Keim and Joe Strobel. No, yeah, Joe Strobel. I believe it was Joe Strobel. Wow, getting older is kind of a funny thing. Anyway, yeah, Joe Strobel was the farmer. He was farming tobacco at the time. They got the first license. They got the first five acres in all of Canada in like, you know, the 73 to 80 years or whatever it was. Our sort of mini claim to fame was that we got the first one the next year um, for Manitoba. And there was another per group that got it in Ontario and Saskatchewan and, and Alberta, all the different, you know, I don't think they all happened the next year. I think Saskatchewan, Ontario, and Manitoba happened. What the years next were those? Year. Well, 94 was the year Joe Strobel and Jeff Keim grew their field. Um, 95 was the year that we grew our first five acre experimental field. Yeah, it was amazing. I took Ron there. I have pictures of us in the Volkswagen van. I'm not sure where those pictures would be, but they are awesome pictures of being in the hemp field, basically. So I asked you now, so what, I don't know this, but what was the first strain that you grew? The first strain that I ever grew was actually um, a Ruderellus that I got from Bud that I got from Al the Alchemist. Like way back when he, funny enough, it was seeded out bud, right? Like it was, and it was a buddy of his that had pr grown it. And it was a Ruder Ellis cultivar and me and my buddy, you know, resin wise, it was definitely not anything worth anything, but it was so precious to us because it was our first and we grew it and we cracked those seeds and we took care of them and we planted them. And this is, you know, in like 90 something and so it was, you know, here we are growing our cannabis and, and really just having an amazing time uh, with it. Um, yeah, late 80s, early 90s is what I really mean. Not, not late 80s. We were 90, 91, 92, that sort of timeline. But uh, we would learn to, uh, you know, the next year, 95, I, to go, I went to Amsterdam and I got seeds of my own and came back with the Northern Lights Closet Queen. I think it was the number five. And I must say, where'd you get your first seed? So thank you for answering. Well, I, and I also got seeds from Luke from Paradise that year. It was his first year at the Cannabis Cup and he was uh, releasing his new cultivars called um, Sensi Star, uh, Dutch Dragon and Amsterdam Flame. So I have all three of those seeds still in my collection. I traded them for some hemp sweaters that we were flogging at the cup that year at the PAX Party House. So kind of neat, you know, and that's 95. Like that's a long time ago. Was that your first year to, to answer that? Yeah, that year I traveled to Amsterdam and Jamaica, both for my first years, places that would become you know, long time favorite places where I would travel back. I mean, I can't even tell you how many times I've been to either of those countries, but it's, it's a lot like double digits. A lot. Dude, I've seen your passport. It's like full. Yeah. And I've done that like to two or three passports. So <laughs> yeah. So to me, I just bought one. So <laughs> yeah, well, that's, 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 great. that's pretty cool. Yeah. Nope. Kind of neat. You know, it, my trilogy in 95 was like Vancouver, yeah. um, Amsterdam and Jamaica. And those three places sort of became, you know, my, 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 my spots. Your spots, like out of these, did you, did you find a favorite strain? Like the one that you really was your go-to? Um, you know, I've always, you know, favorite, for, favorite strains, favorite anythings. They kind of like, as you go through a lot of new things, they can change and alter. So for me, over the years, I've loved hazes. When I first came across terpenoline and that exotic long flowering, um, terpene profile I, uh, that really stuck out to me I've always loved fruity cultivars strawberry banana and watermelon and you know all these things that just have like they just smell like the, the these fruits I've, I've loved that I also love the gas you know not as much as you it's a little lower down on my on my uh, thing maybe in the third spot or whatnot but I have an appreciation for all of it what I like most is to have a selection of all of it and to be able to continually choose which one I want. That's how you really get to know the cultivars that are your favorites. And then you learn they, they're they for certain times. For we certain learned times. that the quiver, I remember. I'll, yeah, it's good to have the quiver, man. Quiver, right? Oh, yeah. yeah. Now that, that brings us right into, of course, I mean, everybody knows you as Bubble Man, as in for hash. So, I mean, I mean, when, when, when did you like, yeah, and we know the story, but when did you pull your first bag? 
what year was the first bag pulled? I would have pulled my first bag in 98, the year that the bags first ever were developed. Yeah. So it would have been about, oh yeah, yeah, 98. It would have been in 98 that I pulled my first bags. 99, March, which is early in March, is the year that I released bubble bags. There, I, there you go. And, and I mean, why seven bags? Well, it's been, it's eight now, uh, to be eight honest. Now, but it's, yeah, well, you got to get the 90, man. That's the eighth bag. But uh, it was, it was R&D. It was over the years with my manufacturer, dialogue back and forth, us testing and trying different microns and screens and sort of, you know, finding out what works and choosing for ourselves. Like, listen, you could have a hundred bags. They're all great between you know, if they're big heads, like in the 150 to 180 range, like really big heads, all the way down to 25 microns, I've seen them come out high quality in all those grades. I've also seen them generally come out in certain parts of those grades better than the other parts. So, you know, depending on different cultivars, you go to Australia and you make full melt bubble and the 25 micron and the 45 micron bags are the ones that are going to fill up. I don't know if it's because of the intensity of the sun. I don't know if it's the production of narrow leaf drug cultivars producing uh, much smaller trichome heads, but it tends to be the case. Uh, and they're preferring the 25 and 45s while people in North America and Europe that are doing indoor grows uh, are preferring that 120 to 73 micron range. So... So it's really depending on if it's indoor, outdoor, different parts of the yeah, world. Yeah, the terroir. Probably. The terroir is always the, th we know that, like that's the, the wine industry taught us that, that the terroir is everything. And when you change anything in the terroir, you're going to affect the outcome of the flavor profiles of those grapes or these resin glands that you're producing, which similarly look like grapes. Oh, they are. That's why we always vote the Terps, right? Save the Terps. Yeah, so in there, but it's definitely one thing. So I'm going to ask, let's talk about, about the best micron and stuff like that. But there isn't really a best, I mean, like bag. It's, well, it's, there is. It's, for you, there is. For you, there is. For me, there is. For yeah. each different person, there can be favorite bag or bags. But uh, there's no word of God on which bag that is. Because we're all different. We are always very different. I like that. Now, everybody knows. I mean, I, 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 I love the bubble hash. It's definitely. And I this is your bubble hash. This is my bubble hash. This is your bubble hash. That's amazing. It's Ninety micron. Yeah, a little medicush just to you know brighten your day a little. Brighten my day. Full and a you little know what? Jar. I mean, I mean, like. Uh, I'm in it, John. I'm in it. You're in it. Dude, that was one thing that I, I learned. I'm surrounded by 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 bubble bags, by bubble now. I, I got a freeze dryer now because it's really about the hash. It's about that extraction. It's about that solventless extraction. It's it's really those flavors and what you get from it, and and it's a whole new thing. It, it, it changed my whole life. I mean, but I mean, when did you get into the the dry sift? Like, when did this start changing? Because you, you had the bags going. Like, tell us more about the sift because I mean, that's I, I love the sift. Well, as you know, in 1995, I went to the Cannabis Cup for my first Cannabis Cup. Cool. Now, I saw the infamous Skunk Man Sam walking around, but I didn't really want to bother him. And I just have never been like that to push myself into meeting people that I wanted to meet because, because of basic, basically like fame, right? Like what I knew about him had excited me to want to meet him, but I didn't want to force a meeting with him. So I never met him that year. But who I did meet was Robert Connell Clark. And he had uh, a Ruhr pipe with some beautiful sift, which I found later to be of Sam's sift. And he put it in the Ruhr pipe and, you know, hit the, hit the lighter and was like, if it don't bubble, it ain't worth the trouble. And that's when I really heard that for the first time, because in 99, four years later, which at that point I had become friends with Rob, I would go to Amsterdam and visit him. And eventually would be introduced to Dave, aka Sam, and become friends with him. Um, but early on, it was just uh, Rob, and he smoked this hash with me, and it melted and bubbled and dripped through the screen. And I was just like, what the? I, I just couldn't your, believe it. This is your first sift hit melt. 
Yeah, like my first like Skunk Man Sam sift hit Melt. So like the real deal. The real, the real deal. Before it really existed in the world. It was just like a crazy thing. Like you were lucky if you maybe trim binned like over the screen very gently and got 50 to 60% heads, but no one had what this man had. Like I can promise you. And so that was the beginning of that venture to be like, I need to figure that out. I need to, this was before I figured out bubble. So I started playing around with dry sifting and single screens and eventually learned about a second screen and eventually learned carding techniques to break up and, and, you know, and that was the early days of that. And so, yeah, it was, um, it was great to, to be able to get turned on to that at a, at a young sort of early beginning. So this and is like 96, 97 years. Uh, it would have been like 95, like 95 was the year that I, that I hit it for the first time. So okay. it would have been early 96 that I would have been on the, on the ball. If not, maybe late 95, there still was about two months or a month left in the year. I can't remember it's how long it took of. me to 95. This is, this is like unheard of. Like really people aren't even thinking of hash that way like the hash that i would get was kind of like uh the stuff here that i got from like 48 north it's kind of like like that that old hash you get from like morocco or or mm. black colombian or you know that, that that scorpion black hash so that was hash that was all i knew about i didn't know about bubble bags or nothing not at all right um so that was pretty cool and i mean you told us about the sift. Now, when you started getting your first screens, when did you get your first screens? You started going through that, but you had, when did you have been like 95, 96? Oh, t speaking of that black hash that you're talking about, are you talking about stuff like this? Is right that what you're kind of? Yeah, I wish you had it. Could you just like throw it over to me and I can like grab on to it. <laughs> And it's funny. I figured you know, as we talk about the different hashes, I'll just change my background to represent those different hashes. That's pretty awesome, actually. I like that a lot. I like that a lot. Now, you've been going to Amsterdam now since 95. You've got all the high times cannabis cups. And uh, I, I actually didn't know. I actually, I think I made, I think I had a set of bubble bags to my friend Justin, um, I think the year before. And I was kind of, I remember I had something going on. So, just briefly, because I had it in my basement, but I, I went to Amsterdam in 2012, and uh, that's I met you. I that's when I met you. That's when I met you. It's 4:19. Yeah. It's a one-minute warning, and um, I mean, I, I had no idea. I was like, "Wow, what's this hash thing?" And you know, I was, I, I'm on my way back now. There's a little story that I was supposed to go to a Legends of Hash party. Somehow, some miscommunication got mixed around, and I didn't ever made it. But uh, we met on the plane coming back. Really, that's when we really truly met is on that plane. And um, coming back, we talked the whole trip. Coming back from Amsterdam, it was it was I don't know how long the flight was, but I mean it was kind of like I've known you my whole life. I couldn't believe that I had been around you. I walked by your back of your store, which was on Commercial Drive back in the days where you had the uh, the melting point. I didn't really get into that, but. Um, when I came back, I said, I have this awesome sift from my Medi Kush underneath this thing. It's 420. And uh, we cleaned that. And you showed me something I had never seen before. This is um, December 6, 2012. And I actually have this video here to kind of look at us. We're sitting here hitting it. But before we watch it, before okay. we watch it, I got I to gotta lead them into it. Okay, Lee, okay, there you go. This is Johnny B coming to my house for the first time, and he pulls out this sift, and he's like, check this out. And he's pretty proud of it. You know, he's like, he's made some sift. It's still pretty early, 2012. Not everyone's doing it. And he's like, check it out. What do you think of that? And I'm like, I think I might have looked at it with a microscope right away. You used your camera. But, yeah, right. I got my camera out, and I showed him, like, listen. <laughs> We're going to work this. I'm going to show you something. And we worked on this shit for 40 minutes before we took this rip. And uh, I wish you could hear the real audio, but we'll talk about it while it's... Uh, while it's oh, yeah. Done. Well, I think we might hit the end. So here, here's this. Now, don't forget, this is the funny part about it. We actually spilt almost all of it. We only had this little bit left to do this rip with. And it's 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 pretty awesome because I've never seen this happen before in my life. I'm, this is the first time me witnessing sift melt like this, clear dome, and I'm just like, holy shit! So now we're 
we're passing back the pipe back and forth. Uh, hopefully we get the end of this, Anil. Are we able to hear a little bit of volume? We'll see, but... And vaporizing it, you know? We're not burning it. If you look, I'm holding the thing and I'm swafting it so it doesn't take oh, flame. You taught right? me, you taught yeah, me how to smoke it. ash. And, and shout out to Beeline, the OG hemp wick company from Kauai. Shout out to those guys. There's all kinds of different hemp lines now, but yeah, I had the Beeline. I still have any right now, but same thing I'm using. The, the actual hemp wick, and I don't think they're around anymore because, you know, other companies have uh, came about, but it was definitely one of those most amazing experiences, especially in 2012, and seeing this, it was just like, One of those moments, you just like, do we get the end here? Well, and I didn't. We, and we should also time. we should also mention how hard we were laughing because we were out of breath, the both of us trying to oh, take yeah. that rip in one rip. It was so much. Not to mention dry sift. People don't realize it robs you of your ability to breathe for about a minute afterwards. You go to like inhale, and it's like, <laughs> like when you inhale that level of terps on a dab and that was a very very big bowl but uh that video must have a lot of views I really it was good. your it was your number one video until um well of course until bubble man world started because at that point i mean i was gonna talk more about that so i mean basically that's 2012 um you showed me something i'd never seen before and all of a sudden i mean Shit, I, I was like kid in high school. I was like hanging out with you every day. You're teaching me all this cool stuff. We started doing videos. And I think that was the starting of Bubble Man's World, 2013. Yeah, that's probably about right. Yep. And I started Bubble Man's World. I was just, uh, yeah, kind of doing videos. And you you were like, hey, I'll come over and do videos. I was like, well, <laughs> come on I mean over and do some videos. And you were like, you really put in the time because man you came over here a lot like that was a lot of travel time for you to come from way over where you were to over an hour and a half each way yeah i was gonna say two to three hours each video and we almost always filmed in this area like and sometimes it was even further we'd go up to squamish or whistler oh, i mean definitely um going the through trooper. that uh that experience of, of, of seeing this dry sift melt, seeing how that was. And then we, then he, then I started learning about the hash and I started learning about the bags. And at the end of this video, we're going to see this great video that we did into this interview of us making some hash. Actually, it's, it's a great video. I think that was one of the first kinds I really experienced really learning how to make hash. Um, because in the beginning people were teaching me to use like a big, big drill. You know, only you, you only need a couple bags, you know. I, like, sh I shut that shit down too. Right after I showed you how to dry sift, I was like, John, you have better material than you realize, which you did, but you weren't doing it right. You weren't I had no idea. It right. And the first time I made it with you, that we made it together, it was fire, man. It was like full melt, like ridiculousness. It, it was it was it was definitely a changing experience and really realizing how much those concentrates helped me because of course I'm a medical patient and I really was going down that hole because I was smoking the, the 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 butter from Butter King and and we were smoking the honey oils because this is what the stuff that was working for me and mm -hmm. uh, at this point um, I mean the more and more things come along um, bubble house became the, the what I wanted but the sift. The sift was something else that it was like a treat. And so you only got it once in a while. You, if you were the grower, you would get the sift. It's not like you, it's not the sift in the bottom of your grinder, guys. You know what I mean? Like, you were like, oh, I get it in the bottom of my grinder. I'm like, yeah, you know, at that point, you've lost it. You're smiling because this, this is not the sift your mother warned you about. This is not the sift that your mother warned you about. I mean, over over those years, um, uh, a lot of trade shows came into play. Uh, we did some videos. Actually, we did some live demonstrations together on making dry sift uh, in, in Toronto. And uh, that's when you, someone stole your camera. That is when someone stole my camera. What a bummer that moment in time was. But we got Dude, through it, John. We what a bummer. It. Did we get through it? I mean, your photography... I mean, let's even talk about that photography. So, I mean, a lot of people don't know, but you actually, uh, you you take some amazing photos, dude. Like over the years, you've you've been shooting trichomes, so your photography is another level. 
I mean, you got a little bit back there. Uh, talk a little bit more about your photography. What got you into photography? What got me into photography was, uh, once again, cannabis. I wanted to learn more, know what was going on, see what was going on, and have a deeper understanding of what was going on. And I realized that the more I could expand my awareness and expand my senses so I could actually perceive what was going on on, on a much smaller level, it led me to macro photography, which was like, I need macro photography to get me in deeper. Sure. Sorry. Uh, no problem. Um, yeah, I needed the macro photography to get me in deeper to be able to see what was going on and more so not, you know, not initially from the hash standpoint, but really from the trichome standpoint. So like understanding what these guys were, what they were called, like how they were, what they were exactly. And I didn't really have a clear understanding, but as I started taking pictures of things like stigma hairs and seeing the little like hairs on the hairs and just really all of the stuff, you know, everything I've ever shot with my macro lens, it just ends up expanding my knowledge base and my level of understanding of what's going on. Um, I think it was Terrence McKenna who said, how come it is the deeper in you go, the bigger it gets? Dude, like, you, you showed me so much with, with, with photography. That's probably one of the most epic parts of being able to come over and we're hanging out the house. He's in the back of that screen in your living room, you always had this photography playing of, of, of snowmobiling and stuff like that. And then all your ice caves and all these cool like off-road shots on your motorcycle and stuff. But I mean, some of the ones that were most amazing, one of the most ones talked about in the cannabis industry, I have this little slideshow and we could probably talk about this slideshow coming in here. So um, as we kind of get going here, I mean, seeds, you, you showed something that no one ever really saw was looking at how these, yeah, I don't hear you right now. You muted yourself. That's hash plant. That's hash plant. And, and those are trichomes in the production of the epicotyl, the first set of true leaves on a seedling. Tri trichome production. That's the picture people stole to make the meme that's oh cri trikey with the like uh, the guy that says crikey. Yeah. That was the one. That was the one? Oh, yeah. Yeah, there's just a few pictures that uh, Anil grabbed up and I was just like, the photography that you showed me and, and the way the plant was demonstrated was it was really amazing to see that and really understand um really uh i thought i heard someone coming in the door here but there's no one home so it must be the wind uh really understand what i was after like i really knew i never know what i was really after and be able to see like the color and then when the plant matured, sweet skunk sweet skunk yeah like that sweet skunk Yep. Um, and understanding then I, I mean, you brought, you, you started selling those little loops. I mean, that's where I got my first one before I ever met you was, uh, going to your store and getting one of the little loops. And I was selling yeah. them with Dr. Hornby at one of the, uh, cannabis days. And I, I bought a bunch of these and I was looking at yeah. all, cause I was like, I had to look at this. And that was just probably just the five months prior to meeting you when you showed me how to clean that. Because at that point, I was just looking at it, all right? <laughs> you need to. You need to be able to see. If you can't be aware of what's going on in the first place, like, how are you ever going to hope to, like, you know, create a, a higher level of purity in the product that you're working with? Well, exactly. And you can see that with, with everything that, that you actually showed. Like, I, I got a microscope. I started taking more and more photography and taking a look at how my trichomes were developing. And, I mean, when it, when it comes to sift... I, I like I like the first bounce, and uh, I, I like that that first little try. Now the color of that I, I've really looked at it before, but the colors really play a key part in, 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 in the development of the trichome. And it's more about I mean, what do you say is the the ideal head that people are looking for? Sure, if there is an ideal head that people are looking for, but there's just a lot of different heads that produce a lot of different unique profiles. And for me. I want them to be expressing themselves at the maximum. I want to I wanna bring them right to the level as if you were filling a, a water balloon, that it would be at the point where it was just about to burst that you would stop putting water in. And that's how I want my resin glands grown. I want terpene profiles to express themselves high. I love the idea of organic, regenerative, sustainable agriculture to grow cannabis. I love the idea of having these precursors in the mycorrhizae of living soils and in the biome that that basically 
are precursors to terpene production for the plant. And then the plant really expresses itself in a way that it really doesn't do uh, when you grow it with salts in the same way. So those are some of the things that I like. That's nice. So I have a lot of pounding. So it must be a heavy windstorm out here because it sounds like, like I said, so I got a little distracted there. I mean, heavy so wind warning tonight. Heavy wind. I had to deflate my my 12 foot uh, snowman and uh, eight foot Santa Claus. I had to get rid of that. I had to make sure that it wasn't going to get blown down. So we talked about dry stiff. We talked about the bubble hash. Um, now, now rosin came into play and really that was that was another eye opener to solventless and and really looking at the whole new hash game and and it kind of like really changed things i mean what, what what's what's which I, I know you've had all these we've been in hash church there's so many things and uh, of what we've all done but i mean what really stood out with the rosin for you like what's what, what was what, what was like wow that's the next that's the next level I love the effect it had on young people making butane oil. That was probably one of my favorite things that it was, you know, as you wrote in your death of butane video series, the death of butane, it really was an accurate title. Did it kill butane production? Of course not. Like people are always going to make butane oil, but we don't hear about people blowing up quite as often now because those same people that were just trying to make a buck and just trying to get by and just trying to extract some resins, they can do it easier with a press. They can do it easier with a hair straightener. It's less expensive. There's way less worry about blowing yourselves up and putting other people's lives in danger. Um, I think that was by far the greatest thing. Now, from my perspective of what I really loved about it was so many people give me flour and I don't smoke flour. And vaporizing flour to me is kind of like, it's just so diluted and I got to vape like a whole quarter to get like a hit that I'm less likely to want to do that. But when I can take that little bud and smash it in my rosin press that sits right here on my desk, well, that's just amazing. And the idea of like compassion clubs being able to test cannabis for weird sprays or smells or flavors, concentrate the oil right in front of them. Um, also, you'll know your returns. Like if you're buying a, a, a cultivar that they're selling as an elite or a quad and saying that it's a 29% THC and you squish it in the rosin press and get 13%. Well, they're full of shit, aren't they? So these are all positives that I thought were pretty cool about rosin production. Also, so I would say the same thing about the bags because the bags are actually truth seekers. I remember that was the first thing you told me is, is the bubble bags, they're the truth seeker. They'll tell you how really good that, that raw, that, that, that bubble is. I mean, if there's any resin in that plant. Um, and, and it really stood out to me because I would go over to other people's places to make bubble hash and they wouldn't get that much in the bag and they blame the bags. You ever get, you get a lot of that, didn't you? Like people blaming your bags. <laughs> You're muted again, dude. It's absolutely always the bags faults. It's uh, and I like that the truth seekers, what I would always say was actually the bags of the word of God. That what they it was. don't care about what your ego or your cognitive dissonance. They just care that they're going to filter the resin. They're going to use water and ice to do the job. And you're going to get a very, very clean, pure ratio in regards to your trichome head results. You know, you want to be in the high 90s. And that's when you've unveiled the medicine. And you can really test it and, and find out what you've unveiled. That's when I, I like to say that we unveil quality that hash makers aren't responsible for quality. They're, they're responsible for unveiling it. And if they unveil it well, and they create a purity that is of, of the highest, highest purity, well then, you know, combined with a grower who's done the, the best job of allowing the plant to live in an environment and in a terroir that allows it to express itself to the maximum of its capabilities, which is you know, the synthase genes that it has that are turned on in the genetics of that particular plant, you want that to be expressed to the maximum, not some like 50%, oh, I've got like systemic mildews and there's bugs on me and all these other things that keep plants from expressing themselves. So, I mean, there, there's a lot of like myths about bags in the sense like um, they don't wash away powdery mildew guys i mean you can't wash away powdery mildew with a 25 micron bag um you have you have warranty on all different bags you have several different bags now actually don't you i mean i mean with how many different bags do you have you have yeah 
Oh, quite a few. We've yeah. got uh, we've got the lights, which are the you know the lowest um, price. The the oh, best right of, there. Yeah, value price bags that I have. You know, they still come with. I think it's like a one or two year warranty. Yeah. We had um, standards. I'm kind of thinking we're discontinuing them and going right back to the original. Standards were in the middle price wise okay. of the OGs, the originals, and the lights. The originals are like twice the price of the lights. They're warrantied for life. They're the real deal. And if you're going to get into hash making and you're not dipping your toes, they're the ones you get. But I'm kind of cutting out that middle range. And then, of course, there's one gallons and five gallons and the 20, which is really a 32 gallon kit. And then the labs are the sort of new, most exciting thing, which That's is, what I was gonna talk you know, about. once, uh, once I started, when I first started making hash at Embark, my, my lab here in uh, British Columbia, it's next on my list. I was just, I was just hand bucking stuff, hand washing stuff with like a brutless. And, uh, I started, you know, pulling bags and we'd pull a lot of bags. We'd wash for eight to 10 hours a day, sometimes 12 hours a day. And it was like 60, 70, 80, you know, 20 to 30 gallon bags that we're pulling. And there's a lot of water that sticks in a good chunk of them. So at the end of like, you know, a month of doing it, I was like, wow, like I'm going to be crippled if I keep doing this. This is really hard. <laughs> I remember you were talking about how your back was sore. We talked about that. Maybe. Yeah. So I designed the labs, which was, you know, not much of a design. I, there's tons of bag systems have sold all mesh and half mesh and quarter mesh, but I worked with my manufacturer to figure out what would work best for us. And we came out with the labs and uh, they're just a godsend. Like I pull bags now every day we pull bags and, um, I know my lab techs aren't getting hurt because of it. I've got to take care of the people that are that are that are doing the work, and the best way to know how to take care of them is to do the do the work yourself first. I'm gonna say you're actually pulling a lot of bags now because I mean, you know, let, let's go back. So you started with Manitoba Hemp Farmers. You got that going. Things changed. You, you got into doing the bags. You started selling bags, and when did Fresh Eddies start? When was the year the uh, of your company starting with Fresh Eddies when you really started? The like guys say that no one was doing it back then, so that was kind of like you were like forefront in the industry of uh, getting people to actually do extractions because no one really was. Yeah, Fresh Eddies started in 1999. 99. That was the year, March of 1999. Fresh Eddies was born, and uh, and why Fresh Eddies? Was a... Who named it? Who, where, where the name come I from? I named it. It's because of the Fresh Headies right. that I was looking to harvest off the little trichomes, the little trichome heads. Because even when I started educating people at an early sort of time, a lot of people could get the trichome message, but they didn't understand that it was just one part of the trichome. It was just the head. Just and the so head. everyone would talk about it kind of like they talk about, you know, CBD. CBD is one molecule of the plant, but people are like, oh yeah, this is CBD oil. I'm like, like only, there's only CBD oil. In, well, no, it's like a high CBD oil. I'm like, okay, so it's a, it's a cannabinoid, maybe terpene. Like there's always other things, even if a cultivar has a bit of CBD or a, a, the majority of it, they'll call it, a, it's CBD. Oh, this one is a CBD. It's like, but you don't really hear people say the same thing about THC, the way they sort of focus on CBD, but kind of got pulled into a tangent there. I'm not sure what sense I'm making, but that's okay. I know you are making a sense because I was going to talk about those different <laughs> size gland heads. I mean, there are different. What, what are the names of those? Because you always used to spill them off. Like there's the bulbous head. There's like, what are the different gland heads that we're looking at? Well, there's, you know, a multitude of trichomes that are present on the plant. And some of them grow on the leaves early on when the cotyledon and the epicotyl come out of the seedling. They'll grow on the leaves to push off of the other leaf so it doesn't tear. Because it's just like wet tissue paper, these, these, uh, these, this plant matter. And so... Those are types of trichomes. I believe there's like six different trichomes that grow on cannabis, but three of them are glandular. And so you've got, um, I'll put up my photo of the trichomes here because that'll make it a little bit easier. Okay. You know, you've got this little, these, this kind of tall guy here, this guy right here, he's the yeah. capitate stalked. There you go. This guy over here is the capitate sessile. This little guy, he's about half the size of the, the stocked. Those are the two as hash makers that we want. Those are the ones that tend to release the easiest under mechanical screen separations, like your first bounce dry sift, or like mechanical screen separations, uh, like bubble hash and water extraction using bubble bags. 
Um, the third kind I don't have a picture of on here, I might actually have one over here, um, is the bulbous. And it's the one that sticks to the cannabis leaf. It actually sits on a single stipe cell, uh, but it appears to be sitting right on the leaf. It doesn't appear to have a stalk or anything like that. And uh, that's the one that is not so easily um, extracted with, um, you know, traditional mechanical screen separations. Mm -hmm. Um, it does tend to be the differentiator in cultivars from hash makers when one guy is using solvent uh, methods to make oil and another is using um, mechanical screen separations to do dry sift or water hash. You'll see that differentiator like, oh, I got 23%, says the oil guy, while the hash guy is like, wow, that's weird because I only got like 14%. It's not always that cultivars will have this huge percentage of the trichome um, population will be bulbous. Uh, but it does happen, and I tend to think that the plants that we call hash plants, the plants that we get most excited about as hash makers, have very, very, very low percentages of bulbous heads. So you may have actually, do you, uh, would you be able to say different strains, or there's some cultivars that stick out more for hash making than others? Say, are they more? Well, sure. I mean. Or? Of course, there's all sorts. I mean, you know them yourself. Anything, yeah. anything, all you have to do is bounce them over screens or wash them through bags. And there's been Excuse hundreds me. of cultivars that have been washed with bubble bags that you can check on the hashtag bubble bag on Instagram and go through so many full melt cultivars when grown properly. It's There's just dozens and dozens and dozens of them. Right off the bat, from a dry sift standpoint, Slee Stack crossed with skunk number one that the skunk man did with DNA. Like, that is some next level dry sift shit. It rains resin heads. You know, back in the day, we called it the hash plant or the champagne. Like, that hash plant was probably 90 plus percent capitate stock and capitate sessile heads. And so it just rained this particular range of high potency 73 to 120 micron wonderfulness. The good old hash plant. I have people asking about that. Like, you get that old, old hash plant from back in the days. I remember you talked about the Renee back in the days. These are some other strains that washed really well. Uh, yeah. But I mean, it's it's really, it really comes down to the grower in, re in reality. Because if you're not growing good resin, you're not going to get a good extraction. It comes to both down to both the genetics and the grower. They can't do it without one another. No matter how good of a grower you are, if you don't have the gene synthases present in the plant turned on to express these particular compounds, you're not going to make it happen, not even with a magic fucking wand. Um, so they're both really like... Not with a magic wand? Come on. You don't... No. You know what? No. You, you, no. You... <laughs> you, you started so many different groups like let's, i mean you, you've got all these different groups i mean your first was actually you have a website um um and what, what was the first like basically form you had going and really discussing this online we're going back oh jeez, yeah like i guess there were i used to go on chat rooms like true stoners which this guy steppenwolf ran and then i ended up on hash beans chat i think I kind of mixed it up. Overgrow eventually got one. I see Mag one has one, but I had one at one point in time called Full Melt Bubble. Yeah. And it's fullmeltbubble.com. The forum is still there. I'm just not really active over there at all. I, you know, one of the things that took off virally was I started letting people have a glass forum on that site and I let them just a huge glass forum erupted on that site where people were trading and buying and selling glass. Yeah. And so you ask anyone that's in the glass community about Full Melt Bubble, glass get a uh, group they'll they'll know about it it was it was pretty popular back in the back in the day as well as it was for making hash and sharing information like that i was a part of overgrow which really helped build my popularity early on as it was the website that was the most popular it had the most um uh members and such uh, almost a, over a hundred thousand i think towards the wow. end of the few years that i was on it which was the early years and i was happy to be honest when all those cannabis websites i wasn't happy that they collapsed in a sense but i was happy that we could stop hanging out there and we could hang out on websites that were more like non locking us into this one topic like i kind of like instagram for that for that matter that there's world people on there and if one of the things you happen to be into is herb well then you can pull into the herb group and if you like tulips well you can pull into the tulip group and all the little things you like can be pulled in instead of us all being segregated from one another like we had been for so many years 
Shout out to uh, Richard DeLisi for s- recently getting yes. out of prison in Thousand Florida for 31 years in prison. Thousand. And shout out to my bro, Rick DeLisi, yes. his son, who is absolutely uh, elated to have his father back. I just uh, just remembered that and I didn't want to forget it. So That's pretty awesome because you actually introduced me to Rick and I got to meet Rick and I actually became friends with Rick and I've, I've talked to him. I just talked to him. Probably about a month before um, they got the news, his dad was being released. I congratulated him right away. I saw the pictures, thumbs up, everything. And I mean, that's pretty amazing. I mean, for a nonviolent crime, for just criminal marijuana, some of this 31 years in jail. When I first met Rick in 2013 now, uh, when I went to Amsterdam, I also we went, went, met him in uh, Barcelona and stuff, but uh, he was then fighting. And, and, and I can't believe it was 20 years then. And, and we were just like, wow like someone's actually in jail for cannabis and and did nothing wrong and and the extent of his 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 time was just catastrophic it's like pretty amazing but it is so good to see his happy face and then 60 people waiting for him outside when he got out of prison i read all of that i saw that i you know steve d'angelo was there with the prison reform projects and stuff like that so all those people there shout out to all the people who are still serving time then they shouldn't be serving time for cannabis crimes i mean definitely we can get into all of that i mean it's it's great to really talk about that and and really kind of look at i mean look at all the people have fought i mean you almost went to jail for cannabis related incident just for driving over a bridge because of the passion that you put into this industry right from the very beginning, we can even touch a little basis on that. I mean, you did a lot of work back in the days with the very first club here, basically in Canada, the British Columbia Compassion Club Society, the club that I went to where I got the beautiful brownies that basically changed my whole life and saved me from opioid drugs. But what happened with that whole thing? And what was your, you know, a little brief little sort of thing. What was your involvement with that club? Well, that, that was really just all Hillary Black. And Hillary was one of my really only friends when I first moved here. I didn't know too many people. I did know Hillary. Hillary knew us me and ron hickey my old mentor friend my awesome bro my like total inspiration in the cannabis world and life uh and ron and i used to drive out here in the early days when mark emery had just started hemp bc it must have been like 92 or 93 or 94 i don't know it was it was a year or two or three before i moved out here and i came out here in 96 so we would drive out from manitoba and we'd bring the haze and Ron would have like big bags of haze finger rub and like just like impossible shit. It was God shit at the time. And uh, so she always remembered us and she was always so sweet to us. And, you know, there was other people that kind of worked there that were a little bit snooty and didn't really have time to share for the guys that drove all the way across the country just to like connect with some activists, you know. And so we were looking for that connection and I got it with Hill. And so when I moved here, obviously, you know, she was in the middle of kind of like, oh, should I move to California and live with Todd McCormick in this mansion in Bel Air? Or should I stay in British Columbia? Should I stay in ho- at home? And should I, you know, do something with myself? I want to do something. I want to build like a club or something. And I was kind of like, wow, I mean, listen, I'm biased. You're like my only friend here. And I just moved here. So I don't want you to go to California and live with Todd McCormick and you know, in a, in a mansion in Bel Air, which thank God, because that's the very mansion that Todd got popped in, did five years on Terminal Island. Uh, That's the same house that um, Rene Boger was seen watering a single plant and was going to be given 10 years mandatory uh, prison sentence. And that's when she, you know, escaped up to Canada and all of that sort of went down. And so, yeah, I was like, no, stay here, like do a club. And I remember her kind of writing on a piece of paper on my living room floor like words and like I don't like the word marijuana and I don't like the word medical and that's sort of how it started as you know cannabis compassion club and so the name was born and I just would you know at the time I was in the herb world I knew where herb was and I was able uh no it was 96 97 Oh 97 98 even yeah that's when i was just like, she was just on a bike well she didn't really have a club yet like she was just a delivery kind of person or she worked she was in a building off like in downtown vancouver originally but then she got the club near like commercial drive commercial unfortunate well it was even before that there was a, a commercial one that was way down by the I didn't know about that one. there you go yeah she was down in that one in like maybe 98 or 99 and then maybe by 2000 she'd know all of this stuff better than i but i you know for me i'm gonna have to all get I on here one day yeah, yeah she's 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 amazing so i would uh you know facilitate anything i could for them and if i could find amazing cannabis 
I would sell it to the club at a loss, you know, happily every time. And so we gained, a, we created a relationship like that where I became sort of an important person in regards to procurement in the early days, making sure that there was cannabis and also making sure that there was gifts for, for the club members during Christmas and, and holidays so they could get little bags of free weed and stuff, which was a huge thing because in the early days she was really only selling cannabis to you know people who were the most vulnerable wow. uh, people that were living on the streets people that were uh, had massive mental health issues people that had terminal illnesses like sometimes two or three of them stacked on top of one another um so it was just a good thing and it continues to be a good thing and so yeah hillary was really the inspiration behind all of it and all i did was try and help facilitate in any way that i could and so that's what uh, when if hillary came and asked me something i would do it yeah, she's uh, definitely going to that club was a huge change in my life. It's it's re really introduced me to cannabis medicine. I've been growing beforehand and and, and understanding decarboxylation, um, how cannabis bind to receptors and going down that whole rabbit hole that a lot of people know about me, but this is about you. So um, definitely um, it was a big change in the life of, of the, going to that club and, and you supplying the cannabis there changed my life because maybe I was at that time, maybe I was getting some of that stuff that you were getting. Maybe, no, I think yeah, at that point we're talking 2005. Um, so that's a little bit more moving into now yeah, I was still I still had my fingers in things that were uh, managing to you know did you ever get out. hash going there did, did, I mean did you ever get any because I don't think I ever got hash maybe I sometimes well, the club the club never really had an understanding of hash you know and then for me I was like by the by the time that came around I was really like focused on selling bubble bags and teaching people how to make it themselves and I donated kits to the club but they would just sit there and never get used and I just thought it was a no-brainer. If one person saw and understood those bags, they could be like, look, let's just, let's get trim from the, the growers that we're buying from should be donating trim to the club. It's very easy to donate and um, they'll, you know, they're getting paid good money for their herb and donate some trim and they've got, so, you know, and a bunch Back of in the days, members. we didn't know what to do with trim. We were throwing it away. You find oh, everyone it, was throwing it, it away. And then one bubble bag came around. People were like, "You got any trim?" And then people were Dude, buying it for two. Telling you that shit. Yeah, that shit changed. Pound, when it started hard. going up, for it started going up in price, and then. Then really extractions really came into play. And that was that big push between, I would say between 2013 and 2018. I mean, that time of, of really when, when the solvent became a huge, big push in the industry between the bubble. Well, because rosin lopsided it. Like with butane against dry sift and wet wash, there was no competition because the bottom line is rosin, you can still make, you know, Butane was unique in the sense that you could just make this gold looking oil, regardless of the quality of, yeah, of course. It's beautiful. Like it's hit it. Um, hit this it. One, this one, this one's the first wash ever from when I saw, I'll keep this for the rest of my life. So um, I will hit the other one beside it. Damn right. Oh man. Look at this. There you go. Here's some Medi Kush uh, fresh that. Well, this is my first batch of the freeze dryer. And really, I mean, uh, and that's even getting back into the hash game here again and stuff like that. But I mean, yeah, so I mean, I remember going to Amsterdam in 2013 and I, and, and I brought some, I bought some bubble with me and that was the, the hash that I left in the freezer for like a year and took it out and brought there and damn that stuff melted. But I mean, the future really what's happening with cannabis now i mean so you 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 get involved you started selling bubble bags um you're moving forward you're doing lots of push and education dude you're one of the smartest guys that i know in the industry that retains information you've been on several stages all around the world um i've been a pleasure to be in a lot of those stages and actually being a part of a lot of those actually talks too which is pretty cool and thank you for that but we're getting back into all those groups that you created. You have Facebook groups, water extraction, and hashtag groups. You have Team Dry Sift, Dry Stuff groups. Uh, where are these other groups that people can actually join and get into a lot of this information that we're talking about right now? Because as we're talking about, like, where do we get all this information that we're talking about? So I'd like to maybe touch base on a few of these places they can go and, uh, you know, some shout outs to some people you want, want to shout out to. Well, I mean, definitely Facebook, I have a ton of groups. I've got uh, water extraction drying technique. I've got freeze drying hashish, lyophilization ovens group. I've got team dry sift. I've got rosin tech, 
Uh, I've got, you know, my Fresh Hens page. There's a cannabinoid research and development page that we still have, Johnny B. There's a Bubble Bags page, a BC Bubble Man, and a Marcus Bubble Man Richardson, all on Facebook. And then I also have uh, the Endocannabinoid System Group, Water Extraction Hash Makers Group, all things terpenes and hash church. So those wow. are just... Yeah, those are just the Facebook groups, dude. It's kind that, of that's that's amazing. I mean, the work that you've put into that and educating people, why you say that now and you look at it. I mean, this is just over the last five years, too. I mean, look at what you've done before, but it's really been a big push over the last few years of getting these groups and that education out there. And I should be heating up my banger, too. But I've been doing the cold start lately just because it seems to be the best thing for me. It's been kind of awesome. So if I didn't have a temp tech, I would absolutely do cold starts as well. I have the temp tech, but lately, like I said, this uh, cold start for me just means I'm not like completely burning all of my shit. The hell? Well, don't you just hit it at like 550 degrees and then it doesn't burn with the I temp tech? Too light. I, I'm liking this way right now. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. No, cold starts it, are nice. It, it, I don't, I don't blame you at all. Let me just say, you know, one thing is, I mean, I've learned to heat the top of the banger first up here now for about eight, ten seconds, so it doesn't roll up. Then I've learned this, and when you talk about dabbing and getting this all going here and stuff, you guys can't really hear me because, of course, I got a loud sports going on. But, I mean, you started really all of the stuff that you did with, with, with D nail and stuff like that. I learned all those different surfaces to dab on. It's really the it's really a game changer, understanding flavors and how to dab and, and understanding how to enjoy actually the terpenes, right? It's true. It's true. In fact, nothing really beats the sapphire. You know, that's the sapphire right there. The sa the sapphire halo dish and the sapphire sheath. And that goes underneath a flat coil and sits on top of your D nail. <coughs> nail. Your D-nail oh, nail. One of my questions I've got missed over, what's your favorite surface that you like to dab your hash on? I just showed you. Sapphire by far. That's, but I, that's, what, I, what I hit more often than not um, is quartz, just because it's overall easiest to clean, less likely to break, uh, withstands thermal shock for cleaning, so you can use liquids. Um, I, I seem, for an overall perspective, like if I was, you know, a king somewhere, and was just getting delivered perfect rips, they'd be like all delivered on a brand new clean sapphire dish. You know, it, it just stains it so badly the first time you hit it, then you need to use heat to heat this up quite hot so that the, and it just cleans perfectly. But in the cooling, they tend to crack. They're nowhere near as strong as quartz uh, and they're, they're just not unable to withstand thermal shock. Um, the way quartz is as well. Well, that's really good information to know, my friend. Yeah, but if I'm traveling, you'd notice when we were in Amsterdam or Jamaica or Barcelona, I would have silicon carbide. I would have those because they're the strongest and they just are really hard to break. You'd have to drive over them with a car and have them at, sitting on a rock or something to, to break them into pieces. Hence, we never broke one. No, well, I broke one once. I got it delivered from Brian from D Nail, and I said, "Hey, it came broken." And he said, "No, nah, dude, it didn't break. It's like stronger than titanium." And I'm like, "Well, I'm pretty sure it broke." And uh, he, I sent him pictures. He said, "Those edges will be the sharpest edges in the world." Literally, he's like, "The he's like, you should try to microscopically photograph them." I, I don't think I ever did though. I mean, so, yeah, UPS truck drove over the the little package, and I guess there was a like rocks underneath rocks so it just, that's how just it broke it, it into pieces yeah well um we got your facebook groups we have your instagram it's got some amazing photos so uh um, yep. your BC instagram bubble bc bubble man um BC you got your facebook man. pages you got your youtube of course which is bubble man's world man's world haven't put anything on there but you know what it's sitting there it's happy to go it'll it's it's gearing up it's just purring away i'm gonna pull a hash church out of it somewhere <coughs> here soon maybe even before the new year well, you're working now you're working you, you got your company embark we'll talk about the future of hash now what's the future Dude. going on 
Well, you know what? It's an exciting time to be a part of everything. It seems like it's it's the right time to be. I mean, you know, hashes have just sort of started hitting the stores in the last year or so. Yeah. They're not really what I'd say abundant. There's not like a ton of full melts and amazing dry sifts. And so there's a there's a space to be filled there. Um, it's a difficult journey for sure, but yeah. um, it's an exciting journey. And I'm just happy to be, you know, slowly building and being a part of a team that's building this incredible company. And uh, yeah, it's uh, it's all around a really great thing. I think Canada is going to see some really beautiful hash in the upcoming years. And eventually wow. it'll just be, we will, of course wouldn't stop John until the highest quality hashes are available for, you know, whatever the most realistic market price settles into without this insane prohibition, like 200, $300 a gram, like, you know, I, I'd like to see hash be well under a hundred grand uh, dollars a gram, you know, and that's what I see it. I see it in the black market for anywhere from 80 to 150 floating around. And it's rare because most people don't have full melt bubble or dry sift to, to sell. So it'll be interesting. You know, everything always is supposed to be competitive to the black market. Um, you could probably sell full melt six star for like $140 a gram and still beat most of the black markets prices because I, do you see it for sale? Do you see it for sale? I don't know anybody who sells it. Cause you know what? A lot of people, it's all home. So it's like you get your screens, you make your sift and you keep that because that's of the, course. you know, the the that that anybody, this is kind of like, I, I came up with a $500 dab. I do my first bounce and then I do my static clean. And, uh, you know what I mean? We get that nice and clean. So it's 99 and, and someone goes, what's that worth? I said, well, 500 bucks. I'm like, well, that's ridiculous. Well, I'm going to sit you down. I'm going to give you education on how it was made. I'm going to give you the first little kind of way how you taught how to vaporize it. You taught me that with the me line. Talk about that flavor and that experience. You can hit that three times. Scott Man Sam will throw that screen away because he only wanted that oh, epic. Right? Oh. He only wanted that clear dome that we're talking about here. Dude, what the first year that I that I was at the Cannabis Cup, he was walking around in his like Birkenstocks in winter. And like just throwing the screens and matches everywhere, you could you could follow them to find out where he was. In the you know, that, that's that, that, that's a treat that a lot of people don't ever get to try. Uh, I'm hoping one day there's a machine or there's something coming out here. I mean, is there any any hints on maybe some kind of magic machine coming out one day? I mean, it's possible to be honest. It's very possible. I have been talking to one very good, knowledgeable friend in the industry who has very deep knowledge when it comes to pioneering things, and he's kind of on the right track with a few key things. And so we've we've been having discussions. Nothing solidified. There's no contract signed, but we're definitely having some discussions. It's good to hear because you're actually quite involved with the uh, in making with Whistler Tech. I mean, you. What I love about this whole thing and coming down the end here, my friend, is is I remember sitting in your house and you said, you know, I'm gonna I'm gonna get this hash lab going in Worcester one day, and I'm gonna have this whole thing, and um, that actually happened. You met, we talked about it, and then and, and, and how the big push, and I, I really look forward to seeing the future of hash being made, um, and where it's going to be on the legal system, and of course, um. First balance you can only get at home, guys, because uh, I don't think that will ever be sold. I don't think you'll ever see that because, uh, you know, I always say, um, grow your own. Well, yeah, big shout out to Whistler Technologies because they are going to be one of the big reasons why people have access to hash across the country uh, beyond, you know, this sort of grassroots level where everyone just keeps it close and maybe gifts out little bits of it. Like we need to set up a system that makes it available to people. So people have choices that are beyond alcohol and sort of these other sort of low vibration choices that it's at least have something else available. Wouldn't it be amazing to have high quality melts at a reasonable price, amazing. you know, and if, yeah, like dry yeah. sifts and wet washes and microns but and you're all these different happen, things. Dude. You're making well, I'm one, one, one person one, of many, one person many, many people. Many. But by and listening to this whole interview and, and talking with you, because I know you very well, but to, to actually go through this, you can you can hear about the dedication and the involvement you've been right from the get go, from being like fourteen years old, right to think what are you now? You're pushing fifty in there, my friend. Oh, yeah. Close, oh yeah. You know, you got a beautiful yeah. family, you got things growing on for you. I'm looking forward to more hash in the future. Um, one of my favorite videos that we did, my friend, was uh, us making hash. So I'm going to leave you guys 
with this video here at the end. We know how to get a hold of you. Everybody knows we're on Pot TV Live on Monday with Carly Marley with uh, Neil with his uh, uh, Tooth Hope. And I always see that we're on the THC show. Then, of course, Greg jumps in there. We got BC Bud Gal. I'm back here Fridays, but we won't see you to the new year because Christmas falls on Friday. We're not doing it. Then it's New Year's Eve, and we're not doing that either. So looking forward to seeing you guys for 2021. I really look forward to doing more interviews. Mark, thank you so much, my friend, for coming on here and just telling your story, man. You know Thanks, what? Brother. We're going to peace it. out to this it video. Nice to, it was nice to hang out with you. Well, this is just contaminant. We'll drop that right on the top. It does look pretty fudgy and decent for contaminant, but contaminant nonetheless... Um, important factor here and why it's always good to have a friend to help, especially when you're, you know, at this point uh, on the process. The bags need to be cleaned immediately. They can't, you can't take your time with this process. It really needs to happen quickly. So John's going to do that right off camera. We have a hose and how he does that is he just, he squeezes the screen in his hand to flip it inside out. By squeezing the screen, none of this contaminant ends up on the edge of your bag. So I want to grab that and just give it a nice clean rinse. Um, that's the 220, so we're rinsing it off into the ground. As we get down, I suspect the 190 won't be worth keeping, but the 160, which I know a lot of people don't even keep, is I've been finding nice heads in those heavy, thick, you know, indica dominant strains that are grown indoors. They produce a nice big bulbous head, and uh, the 160 is worth smoking, in my opinion. It's I've pulled it out, and it's been dabable, full melt, so kind of hard to uh, not be in support of that. Nice, very low amount in the 190, which is, you know, not bad at all because I consider it a contaminant bag. Which means there wasn't too much contaminant in this batch. Keep in mind, we've run 400 grams of fresh, so that's anywhere from 100 to 150 grams of, of dry. Um, when I did that same amount with Remo a couple weeks ago, uh, we got just under 10 grams with that. So, all right, here's another one. I'll take that one. Excellent. So another good thing with these bags is when they're wet, you know, you make sure they're properly clean and properly rinsed. Um, you want to leave them out to dry. You don't want to fold them all up dry. They're just or wet. They're just like a tent. And you know how a tent goes funky if you fold it up wet. It's not a good idea to do. So, you know, these bags are pretty sturdy. They'll just stand up on their own but uh, put them somewhere where they can air dry out for a short period of time. Um, all right, we're down to the 160. Generally the bag where we can potentially start to see some decent heads. Not always, but we can see them in, the, in this bag sometimes. This color is very blonde. There's not a, a ton of it in here, but it's very nice color for 160. That looks pretty ridiculous. Uh, maybe just go around oh, and lean it on that chair. That's fine, thanks man. Oh yeah, this looks really nice. Also a small amount, but I'm never too worried about the small amounts out of the, the top two, three bags. You can see right away why we would use these three different bags though. Um, this is nice enough that I'll actually wow. save this resin. Uh, there's not a ton of it on the screen, but this 160 I'll gladly uh, dip into my 120 because the quality is there. I can see that it's there. And even though you've done this and the screen might look clean, You've used terpene soaked water, and so it should still be rinsed. I know water is not a solvent, but water does act slightly as a solvent in this process by breaking down water solubles. And how you know that that's happening is by the fact that the water is no longer clear after you've mixed uh, you know, some cannabis for five or six minutes. So up to the 120 here. This bag's draining a little bit slower. Of course, I could give it a few little jerks and it would just release right away, but it shows that there's more resin present in this than the last few, and there definitely is. It's a nice uh, nice little puck. Yeah. Absolutely. Good. I'll end up uh, uh, taking photos of each grade, not necessarily in the bag, because I don't have another camera right off by hand here, and I don't want to take the one I'm using, but I'll show you all of them once they've been pulled um, all together in one pile. Uh, one nice thing to mention is the hash gets easier and easier to pull out. 
of the bag as you get up the grades. As you get into a higher grade, the hash just seems to come off a lot nicer. This is a nice big spoonful. Wow. That's awesome. So, uh, rock that out. It's extremely, like, the color is unbelievable. It's just completely blonde. Really, really nice. I didn't have any doubts that it would be. Keeping in mind, that's the 120. You know, that 120 right there was probably nicer than most people's 73 that I see. Yeah. Exciting. Look at the color of that water. I know, the color is really pretty. There you go. It's very I'm purple. not getting a chance to see this. I'm busy working here. I know, you're helping, you're doing good. You're helping extract you're helping your me. medicine. Um, Alright, so this down to the 90 micro. See, it's just a wonderful amount. It's just floating around like sand in there. I love that. Oh yeah. This is a nice bubble. I would, I'll, I would bet that you will potentially say this is the nicest bubble that you've had from your herb. This is really going to be nice. Yeah. Fresh frozen, that's why. Yeah, fresh frozen is a good uh, oh, lots a good of things start. come in a factor. Absolutely. Here, let's just make a little room. I'm noticing right now we're getting a little bit close with all these resins. This one needs to get up to. You need another screen, maybe? No, no. If you make, if you put it all proper, it seems to usually fit. All right. Pull the 90 out. 90 is a nice healthy amount. I'd say there's, oh, it's hard to say, but maybe two or three grams I'm here just in this, grams. in this particular bag. You know, the, the last one I think I pulled about a gram or two out as well. And uh, I think we'll probably be right on par for around, you know, 10 plus grams. Ah, we both grow the same kind of goodness. Yeah, this is looking great. Very nice. Oh. Anytime you have lo extra resin that doesn't want to let go, it's easy to just dump it into the next bag. Really good tip. Clean your spoon. Clean your bag of all these valuable resins. Clean it inside your next bag. So you're not losing that resin. Um, when I'm pulling a lot of bags and I have sort of a, a, a thing set up where I'm, you know, I've got 40 or 50 or 100 pounds of material. Um, what I'll do is I'll have a bin. It's a small uh, square Tupperware bin and I have it half filled with water and I usually leave quite a bit of ice in there and I clean most of the bags between 120 to 45 in that bin. And then at the end of the process, you want to rinse that one, John? At the end of the process, I basically uh, run it all through, through a set of bags. So we're on to the 73. This one's already holding like three gallons of the water. Um, people wonder how to drain these bags properly. It's really not that difficult if you just give it a bit of a lift. When you lift, the resin jumps off the bottom of the screen and it lets the water rush through. So I hear people having a hard time with the 25 and the 45 and I'll show you how fast I can, uh, I can drain those bags as well. It doesn't take much time. Sometimes it's nice to put a little oxygen, a little air in the bag and kind of slide your hand down and use the air itself to push out some of that extra moisture, some of that extra water. We get the 73 here. This is looking really nice and creamy. Just as nice as the last one, if not even nicer. Ooh, yeah. And once again, pulling, pulling a solid couple of grams out. So that's always nice. Something the bubble head always likes to see. A good amount of resin coming out of his bags. How come mine doesn't come out full melt like yours? Here's a question I get quite a bit. Particularly from kids that are buying buds, ounces, spraying them, and uh, get, making some oil. Uh, but they're wondering why they're not getting, you know, when they take the same material and, and try to dry sift or wet wash, they don't, their resin doesn't melt. So. One of the reasons that that can happen is, is that, of course, when you're making a solvent-based extract, it's going to melt the resin heads. It's going to, it'll be melt no matter what, uh, even if it's taken to a, a shatter or a hard temperature or a hard uh, uh, texture. It's still going to melt the minute you hold a flame to it because that's it's the oils extracted from from the plant. 
Um, the same thing extracted with the wax membranes, if, if it hasn't been grown properly, those wax membranes will be very thick, like a, almost like a Tootsie Pop, with a very small amount of goodness on the inside and a very thick membrane on the outside. And that's not the hash we want. It's generally not the stuff that gives good yields. It's not the stuff that makes inspirational hash. Uh, and that stuff is usually people focused on two things, which are prohibition-based, and they're vegetative yields and uh, flowering periods. How much uh, uh, will I get and how fast will I get it? So when you sort of move away from those two things, um, you get into a situation where you can start growing resin and focusing on it rather than the, you know, the, the plant, vegetative plant yields and the flowering periods. You can focus on uh, the resin and the maturity of the resin. So. All right, we're going to pull the 45 now. Don't even worry about it. Just lay them down, honestly. It's all good. I'll go through them later. We'll probably be running another batch through them, so... As long as they're clean. Even if I'm going to run another batch, I still clean the bags. Oh, yeah. And rinse them right away, because you see how fast this resin can, can dry. So we're now into the 45. We've got some 45 and some 25. We've got our 190, our 160, our 120. We've got our 90. Upside down. This is 45 right here, so this yeah. has to be 73. Yeah. This has to be 90, 120, 160. Oh, the two, this is 220. 220. That's right. The 220 was throwing me off. It's kind of brown and trippy. It almost looks like a collection of or pistolate hairs that are, you know, overripe. <laughs> Doesn't it? Yeah. All right, 45. One of the nicest ones to collect because it just comes off the screen so darn nice. I don't know if it's because of the smaller heads or what it is, but it usually comes off really nice. All of 45. A little bit more there. Uh, lots of different ways to collect this. You can also, um, you know, I don't always do it this way. I'm almost doing it this way just out of the, the ease of how it's set up. But often I would have a bowl and I would take this bag and I would set it inside the bowl and I would wrap the outsides around the bowl and I would make the screen real, real tight. Then you can use like a sharp sort of plastic business card and it just picks up really nice. This works just as well too. I've made enough batches that I can be still pretty clean and efficient doing it the way I'm doing it. But if you really, you know, don't want to lose resin and you want to make sure your, your, your stuff is more secure, get a bowl about the size of the bottom of a five gallon bucket and flip these inside of that bucket each time. I could even be doing it right over this bucket. You know, you don't even really need a bowl. I could literally be doing the same thing basically like this get the bucket stretched over and just get that screen tight so you can pull and, and get the uh, get the resin off of it it's, once you get the screen tight it's pretty much a breeze to get the resin off so this is an upside down bucket it won't be very hard boom you know something like that and then you can scrape it off so nicely that it's uh, you know it becomes pretty easy all right, so if you want to rinse that one off, it's uh, on the in that's the inside there. So it'll have to be flipped inside out again. And we'll do our last 25 micron bag. The one everyone hates to pull. Yet I tell people, would you really throw away this bag and not use it when it could pay for your bags? It could be given to someone for medibles. It's still medicine. Um, I'd say we have about two and a half gallons of the five gallons of water in this bag. You can see the way the resin's pooling on the screen and it's letting a very small amount of water in. I'm going to slightly jerk it upwards. Yeah, just give it a little jerk upwards. The water, the resin, it all lifts. You do this maybe six or seven times. I'm already down to a liter of water and a few more times and I'll be down to a couple shots of water. And then you can do the air. Which will also push some air through with the resin. I don't really want to squeeze the screen too much, but you can kind of give it a little bit of a screen, a squeeze this last one, the 25 micron, which is always a little bit of a 
little bit funny. Okay. Another way to do what I showed earlier with the bowl. A guy like me with a big hand can basically hold the screen in my hand like that and also scrape off the hash. Just a matter of holding the screen tight, letting the hash come off. And that's the 25 micron right there. Really nice and creamy. I'd say right from the 160 on, this is going to be full melt. All right, welcome to the THC show with Neil, where we talk about the unpleasant truths of our of our system and our democracy here. I help patients. I got my got I, rated, I know what you're I saying. I got rated for growing, and I'm staring at the cracks in the wall doing time, and I'm trying to figure out who I hurt. No victim, no crime. And uh, we look for avenues of uh, hope and ways that we can uh, change some things. Uh, as you can see, there's a lot of people, and there's a lot of uh, care packs that we're handing out there. I am not a criminal. Oh, yeah, wow, yeah. look at this. Right, hey, yeah, yeah. 420 for sure now. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I'll be back next Tuesday for another episode of THC Truth, Hope, and Change. Uh, go about changing the world as best you can, and while you're doing it, just have as much fun as you can. Thank you. Hi there. Welcome to the 420 Lifestyle Show. I'm Carly Marley. <clears throat> She's taking a dab. <laughs> um, uh, we can play the sick and moose video. Oh, yes, yeah, sick and moose video. Know, it's past. Let's play yeah. the sick and moose video. <laughs> Hello there, first time viewers. Welcome to Pot TV. Welcome to Pot TV. Let them go! 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 It is only now, once we've written, reached this point of critical mass, that I could really tell you the story because that's the interactive nature of the internet. TV is an internet uh, video based site. We've had uh, over 6 million shows watched. Uh, we get about 10,000 shows watched a day. Shows on growing marijuana, medical marijuana, politics of marijuana. And at that time, most uh, magazines or books revolving around marijuana were, were prohibited literature. From cookbooks to grow books, books about the cannabis culture, mushroom books, even psychedelic books. The, the mass injustice being done where millions of people in this country are being scapegoated, having their rights and their property and their, and their leisure time and their privacy and their freedom of movement all stripped away from them. And they pulled me off from behind. They pushed me down and put me in handcuffs and they locked me in the paddy wagon. This is what it's all about, a little green plant. You, the taxpayers, are being asked to subsidize a war on a little green plant. I know it's scary and difficult and frustrating, and politicians are a fraud. Try and change that and be a voice of truth. For many, many years, decades. In 2001, Canada legalized marijuana for medical purposes. Pot TV news flash breaking story, July 9th, 2003. Uh, I became leader about uh, nine months ago. You have how many locations and how long have you been serving the people of the community for? Well, I, I started in 2004. Because as long as you're not hurting anyone else, as long as you're not causing any harm, then why should you be dealing with police or prisons or agents of the government? A former DEA agent and author of Powder Burns, Cocaine Contras and the Drug War. 
in the media often and the media reports uncritically all too often. I saw this video and I was like, whoa, man, seems like there's something to this. Join me weekdays on Pot TV. We're going to be doing a new show here on Pot TV. On Pot TV. Telling your power combines poetry, music, art, video clips, and photographs with a variety of interesting guests who are involved in the medical cannabis industry. It comes on here at 420. Cannabis indica or Indian hemp. It was tasted by the priests on sacrificial occasions. So I'm going to stop and smoke a joint. Just figured I'd show you my surroundings here. Beautiful, beautiful little flowers everywhere. Hemp and its many applications, how hemp can be made into paper and fuel and clothing and that. Two different samples. Now these are the same cut, grown in the same room with two different soil mixes. As a, a line diagram, okay, and this is a, a cross section of a bract. Now on some of these plants too, there's something called pre-flowers that form. Sometimes eight to 12 weeks into the veg cycle, you can look three or four sets of branches down from the top. Hey, wait a second, I'm not even smoking joints. I'm talking. We need real cannabis dispensaries. Many, many patients who use cannabis as a medicine need access. You're taking the medicine away from sick and dying people. Let's overgrow the government. Let's have more marijuana than they can ever stop. But while you sit here and join this, remember those who are in prison this moment, locked away from their loved ones, locked away from their friends, and that could be you. I just want to say thanks for watching Pot TV. You can't get higher on the net.